Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our second CTSC Black History Makers Celebration. Uh, but before we begin, we want to tell you a little bit about the CTSC. The Clinical and Translational Science Collaborative of Northern Ohio is a collaborative among Case Western Reserve University and its affiliated hospital systems, the Cleveland Clinic, Metro Health, University Hospitals, and the Lewis Stokes Veterans Administration Medical Center, Northeast Ohio Medical University, and the University of Toledo. We aspire to be a catalyst for high quality clinical and translational science and transformative research to positively impact the health of those in Northern Ohio and beyond. Here's what you can expect today. We'll do some introductions in the chat and then we'll hear a fantastic presentation from Dr. Hall and then we'll have time for moderated Q&A from our moderator, Larice Purnell. Larice Purnell has 19 years of experience in business management, taxation, and finance. He is currently the managing partner of Clee Consulting Firm, an accounting, tax, and payroll services company located in downtown Cleveland and one of the largest minority firms in Northeastern Ohio and co-owner of Black Box Fix Restaurant. I have had their food. It is amazing. He is also founder and visionary behind The Real Black Friday, which has celebrated its eighth year anniversary and is responsible for helping to bring awareness and providing access to black owned businesses throughout Northeastern Ohio with an over $5.5 million economic impact. Outside of work, Larice stays busy spending time with his wife, Rashonda, sons, Gavin and Maceo and daughter, Gabby, serving the community, playing sports and traveling. And now for today's Black history maker, Dr. Gregory Hall. Dr. Hall is a native of Cleveland and graduate of Williams College. Dr. Greg Hall is an internal medicine physician practicing in Richmond Heights, Ohio and at University Hospitals. Dr. Hall is an associate professor in both the internal medicine and integrative medical sciences departments at the Northeast Ohio Medical University and an assistant clinical professor at Case's School of Medicine. Dr. Hall was a governor appointed member of the Ohio Commission on Minority Health and served as chairman for many years and currently serves as the board president of the Cuyahoga County Board of Health. Dr. Hall wrote Patient-Centered Clinical Care for African-Americans, a concise evidence-based guide to important differences and better outcomes, which is the first comprehensive book detailing the optimal clinical care of African-Americans. He is established in the nonprofit Excuse me, he established the nonprofit National Institute for African American Health, which mentors Black pre med and medical students in their studies. They facilitate research initiatives in partnership with academic institutions and provide an online resource for consumer health education. At university hospitals, Dr. Hall was awarded the Edgar B. Jackson Endowed Chair for Clinical Excellence and Diversity, and he is the medical director of University Hospitals Cutler Center for Men which takes a multidisciplinary approach to improve all men's health. Dr. Hall, kudos to you. So, so great to have you with us this afternoon. The floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you. Well, that was a, mouth, a mouthful. <laughs> so what I'm, gonna, um, I'm gonna go over uh, some of those things to you and then I'm looking forward to the discussion at the end so we can uh, we can get hear, 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 what, hear what Mr. Purnell is doing and. And, and his perspective on these things. Uh, so you see my slides? Excellent, excellent. So um, so let's talk about let's talk about Nia real quick because you mentioned it and uh, at, um, National Institute for African American Health. Very proud to have gotten it off the ground. Um, and and it, our executive director actually is based in Arizona. So it's 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 been a, it's been a great thing. The mission specifically is to increase the number of black doctors, basically, um, uh, through mentorship, through improving the amount of students that get into medical school and also they get out. So through um, through supporting pre-med students, black pre-med students and black medical students, we can get them into medical school and, in, in a, and out of medical school. So that's our primary our primary goal to do that. Um, I as I went to to uh, go to medical school, I, I had never never um, shadowed a doctor before I became a doctor, uh, before I was in medical school, rather. I had never had access to ask a lot of questions of, you know, questions, simple questions that that, that I needed. I needed the answers to rather than to live them, live them without those answers. Uh, and so this is a, a critical uh, a part that Nia is just trying to set up an organization that they can support, uh, support uh, Black pre-med students and medical students. So that, and through that, 
we increase the number of Black doctors. Uh, we also have an online source, NIA.org, which, which we want to be a reliable and trusted source of health information because there'll be uh, information put out by, by the Black doctors that are acting as mentors, right? And then we also want to improve uh, the culturally competent care for African Americans. There's things to learn, there's stuff to know about African American health in terms of bias, in terms of you know, half, 45% of African American patients don't like doctors like myself. They don't like hospitals. Uh, and so if you go in not knowing that, you're at a disadvantage already. If you go in a room and a person doesn't like you and you don't know, you're at a disadvantage, right? You want to know who doesn't like you when you go in a room. And so um, that no, just having a, you know that knowledge about how some some patients perceive doctors and hospitals when, when you, you have the perspective, oh, doctors are so helpful and wonderful and they're smart and all that. And you go in the person thinking, I hate doctors. Uh, that's a disconnect, right? And so educating patients about that and then the nuanced care in African-Americans is, is kind of one of what NIA wants to do. So we call our, our mentors the NIA scholars uh, because they're all scholars because they're all pre-med students. They're all taking organic chemistry and physics and whatnot. So they're scholars. And then the, the, the Black doctors across the country that are mentoring them are our medical experts and they advance information to the site. Uh, so this bar just looks at the percentage of people accepted to medical school and right by the arrow, 7%. Of uh, medical students accepted are African American. You can see right above that, Asian American, 22 percent, and then white American, the big green, uh, of 49, almost 50 percent accepted. And so that's there's you know 13 percent of the population versus you know 7 percent uh, accepted. You know is, is is sort of a disconnect. Looking at uh, a, a mission within a mission, there's also a decreased number of men. So on the left hand side, it's women uh, uh, um, enrolled to medical school, and you see uh, black women about 5% for 2020, and right below that, the squares, is Hispanic Latinos, and then along the bottom that you can barely see are Native American, Alaskan Natives, um, so very low rate of them. And if you look on the men on the right-hand side, um, you can see that that Black men have, are, have dropped below Hispanic Latino men in terms of enrollment in, in medical school, so we're also trying to support Black men pre-med pre -med, uh, students as well. Um, and then, right, timing is everything, um, then comes affirmative action, right? They've reversed affirmative action. And, and um, so things have gone from bad to worse, or, they, or they're going to go from bad to worse. Trust me, right? It, trust, me, trust me, right? Uh, then in medical school, um, there's a lot of students that dropout rate is high. So if you, as hard as it is to get into medical school, um, it's even harder, it's even, not even harder, but it's also hard to, to stay in medical school and not leave. And so students are dropping out and they, they blame bias and diversity as a, a lack of diversity as a reason for that. So if you look at this, this talks about the, the attrition, students that are able to that drop out of medical school. So at the top, you can see a, a, that matriculant number 33,384. That's the total number of medical students, right? And right by black, there's 2,104. So just kind of digest that for a second in terms of the pure number, right? And then look how many, uh, uh, the attrition, out of that 2,100, 120 don't graduate. So that's a huge percentage of, of that low number, right? And so that's, you know, people who have taken in student loans to go to medical school, they've told their family, I'm going off to medical school, and 120 of them in a country, which is way too many, compared to look at the total attrition, right? 938 medical students across everyone don't graduate, and 200 are there 120 of those are African American? So that's that's a huge disparity as well, and, and, and there's no explanation for that. And again, why have the increased number of Black doctors? Can't other doctors competently care for African Americans? Well, it's been shown that this study showed that when there was increased number of Black primary care doctors in the county, all the Blacks lived longer, right? Which is which is really crazy. So they found a greater primary care physician workforce represented. Yeah, um, had, had the black people in those counties had better outcomes. If there was at least one uh, black primary care doctor in the county, the black people did better, right? And so it, us trying to increase the number of black doctors um, is 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 a uh, is definitely worth the time and energy. And so uh, uh, you know, shameless plug: uh, if you've got some extra money or <laughs> extra resources, please uh, try to support Nia. Uh, you can go to nia.org. There's a don't big donate button. I, I, you can't miss it, uh, and and kind of help us out. Big or small, uh, I, um, gifts are accepted. So <clears throat> switching over to life expectancy, um, 
we look, this is the latest I've got from November of 2023, uh, looking at our overall life expectancy. And it's no surprise to anyone that our life expectancy took a dip with, with COVID-19 and, and 2020 and, uh, and, um, and 19 and 20 uh, and 21, um, uh, life expectancy for, of everyone went down, right? And so if you look at how much it went down, um, for example, from the left-hand side, average life expectancy of Hispanic Latino, 80, almost 82, that went down to 77.8, for example. Or Asian Americans, 85.6 went down to 83.5. White life expectancy, 78.8 went down to 76. And Black life expectancy, 74.8 went down to 71.2. And you see Native Americans, 71.8 went down to 65.6, which is, which is staggering, right? But thank goodness, it ended. So now, 2022, we pay, we've had a little bit of a rebound in life expectancy, and that's a, that's all good news. And th uh, thankfully, uh, we're, we're going back up. But if you still look at that, I mean, if you this is Black History Month, so we have to look at we're going to look at our bar graphs. Uh, at least I do. Um, you know, 72.8 is still pretty low compared to Asian Americans, 84.5, right? So that's there. We're still uh, and thank thank goodness Native Americans went from sixty five to sixty seven, almost sixty eight. <laughs> so when we look at the changes when when the rebound, right? We uh, Hispanic Latinos gained two and a half years. Men did, and and women gained one point five compared to uh, one point seven compared to Black Americans one point five and one point five. And so the least amount of gains uh, were in white Americans. So when we look at it, everyone assumes, which is reasonable to assume, that all those all that difference was due to COVID, right? And 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 in fact, the majority of the difference, eighty four percent of of the the change in life expectancy was due to COVID death. But if you also look, and this is overall, but if you look specifically at African Americans, it's still eighty, you know, seventy seventy two percent of that. But look at look at what changed, like legal intervention, which you won't see this on anyone anyone else's. Um, slide, right? Legal intervention, there's there's been less, fewer deaths uh, to African Americans due to legal intervention. So us bro protesting and awareness all actually had a positive influence on, on um, basically being killed in, in, the, in the process of being arrested or held. Um, and then look at homicides. Homicides got worse over the last couple of years. And so um, that percentage is significant. So if you look at the lifetime risk by being killed by police. And this, I've had spoken to police officers. This is a reliable source. This is not something someone made up, right? And so if you look, excuse me, you look at it, you'll see the blue bar on the left is men, right? And there's a very skinny red bar on the right that's women, right? So you, you I didn't see it the first couple of times I looked at it. So I'm going to say, if you look at it closely, you'll see the big blue bar where it says African American, that's men. There's a little sliver red on the right hand side. That's African American women, and so the same thing as you go down Native American, uh, Latinx, total combined, basically everyone combined, then white, and then Asian Pacific Islander. There's a significant increased risk for African Americans to be killed by the police, and this is not this. I'm not making this up. This is just the facts. No commentary goes along with that, but it's just striking to me that how few women. Are how few women are killed. There's more. There's less women combined killed compared to Asian and Pacific Islander men, which means that if you if you know some women, I grew up in Glenville, so I know some women that that well. I won't go there, but the point is that that they they cannot be killed. There there there's a way to not kill people, and women know that with that whoever that secret is right. And and African American men like myself do not we we're we're in in trouble. And I laugh because you have to laugh, and otherwise you'll get mad at and you won't be able to go forward. Looking at the leading cause of death for black males, again homicide is number one until you're 44, right? So I've got three sons in their 20s. Their number one risk for death is to be killed, right? Their number two risk for death is this thing called unintentional injuries. And what that is, is accidental overdose. That's fentanyl. That's the, that's the biggest, you know, it's rock climbing, but we don't know any rock climbers, right? And it's in car accidents and those those have gotten gone down significantly. So really the vast majority of unintentional injuries, the number two cause of death is overdose, accidental overdose of some sort. And then you see suicide down uh, number uh, number four. And if you look at all, all people, ages, all African-American males, homicide is still 
number five. So we use that as a comparison when you say, um, you know, looking at white males, uh, the number one cause of death is unintentional injuries, fentanyl overdose, right? Number two, suicide. Let's see, where is homicide? Oh, there is homicide number four in, in one to 19. It doesn't make the list in terms of 20 to 24. And it doesn't, uh, there it does, it does in number five. And then overall, you see heart disease, but stroke, but homicide and unintentional injuries are at homicide. This doesn't make the list. So when we look at Asian Americans, they're the gold standard. You know, you never hear about health disparities. You hear blacks compared to whites, but whites are not the gold standard in terms of living. Asian Americans are the gold standard in terms of living, right? And so they live the longest, as I showed you earlier. Their number one and number two causes of death from one to, to uh, age 44 is suicide and unintentional injuries, right? There's no homicide. Well, there is homicide number five at, at the um, bottom uh, for, for one to 19. And look at that number. Like homicide was like 30%. For African Americans, it's 5% makes number five. Right, so it's, there's, it's, not, it's like apples and oranges. And then overall, again, homicide doesn't make the list uh, for, for the top five for Asian American men as well. And I just, you know, just know that. So that when we look at what helped, what helped patients, this is a, um, for white patients, um, you know, COVID was the vast majority of it. And so you should know that, that as we, as COVID goes away, we're gonna see those numbers uh, juggle a little bit. So now, CDC has already said that African Americans are living with 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 pr problems at younger ages, right? So there, I've got two nephews that have diabetes. We're seeing diabetes in people in their twenties and teens, and, and we didn't see that twenty years ago. We see we're seeing hypertension. They're teenagers with hypertension, black teenagers with hypertension. That didn't exist when I when I started medical school, right? And so these these things, people are having strokes in their thirties and forties, and so. We see these problems, and so the problems that, that we used to associate with older ages, or we're seeing those in younger people, right? And they're and unfortunately they're dying from it as well. So if you look at the colon cancer mortality, again, African Americans have the highest. You see that breast cancer mortality, African Americans have the highest, but we have the African American women do not have the highest occurrence of breast cancer, but they have the highest mortality. So that again, that's another another disparity. Um, Prostate cancer, again, the high African Americans, the highest mortality. And even the flu and pneumonia, you see that as well. And even, even though the rates have gone down for COVID, African Americans still have the highest death rate for COVID. So um, even though the, the overall levels are low, we still have the worst rates for COVID as well. So what do we do with a um, roundhouse turn here? <laughs> Is uh, at University Hospital, we, we established the Center for African American Health to address these specific things, not to try to help uh, black pre-med students get into medical school, not or get out of medical school. We're trying to address the health care of African Americans. And so we're gonna do that through having a provider network webpage, scheduling hotlines. We're gonna have engagement, te teaching our providers how to learn about bias in themselves and bias in patients. We're gonna, and, and we're gonna have best practices because there are best practices in, in treating African Americans and screening and prevention and things of that nature. And they say, really, well, do you need to have a, a center for African American health? Is that really appropriate? Well, across the country, there's Asian Health Services, Asian Heart and Vascular Center in Texas. Uh, there's Asian things. So there, there are things, and, and they're doing well. Hispanic Latino centers all across the country, um, in New Jersey and in, in, in Chicago, uh, really specializing in, in Hispanic Latino health. And so, again, if you look at the difference between Hispanic Latino life expectancy and African Americans, there's a seven year difference, uh, difference between Asian Americans and, and, and African Americans, 11 year difference. So if certainly if they have centers for African American, for Asian and Hispanic Latino health, then there's there's no reason why we shouldn't have one or, or no reason why we shouldn't have one already. And there's differences in, in the treatment of hypertension and prevalence of, of dialysis, of people needing dialysis and kidney disease and on and on and on. So, and aside from those differences, people know about the African American patients report being discriminated or unfairly judged by their healthcare provider three times higher than white patients and twice as high as, as Hispanic Latinos. And so we're not happy with the healthcare that we've been getting. So we're really gonna increase in access, we're gonna increase engagement, the clinical care is gonna be better, we're gonna have better outcomes, and then the patients will stay because they're getting a, a product that they're getting. This, I took a screenshot when we were, I was meeting with the Department of Radiology, we were talking about best practices in African-American health. 
no meeting like that has probably ever happened in the history of the United States, right? Where people got together and said, we're talking about African-American health. We're not talking about minority health. We're not talking about poor health. We're talking about African-American health, right? And so that we, we kind of came up with some recommendations. And I think we're going to do that with every department. And we're also going to stress health literacy and patients, you know, so people know about blood pressure and they know how important it is. They start measuring it at home and they know when they're supposed to be screened so they can even nudge their 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 doctors if they're not doing that. So I know I went through that fast, but I, I'm trying to keep, keep Jalice will get on me if I, if I throw everything off. Uh, so I wanted to now go back, take a breath and hand it over to my moderator. So... Let me first say um, that was great information, um, Dr. Hall. And, you know, one, I want to say kudos to you, first of all, because uh, you jumped right in. Uh, let's make sure we celebrate, you know, the work that you did before we start this conversation and say congratulations on being recognized as one of our Black History uh, makers for this, you know, Black History Month in 2024. So as everybody can see who's listening, they can see all the great work that you've done, not just locally, because I, I spent a lot of time on Nia as well doing the research, and I see that you're making national impact. And, and I'll say as a black man to be on here today, you know, I'm very proud of the work um, because we know this is information that we need desperately in our community. So, so again, thank you and kudos to you and continue to do all the great work you're doing because we need it. Um, we, we continue to need that. So we're gonna jump right into the conversation though. Um, and uh, before I get started though, because I know some people tend to leave earlier, let me ask a couple questions um, because I don't wanna lose anybody at the end. Um, Dr. Hall, are you currently taking new clients? Yes, yeah. Okay, so what I wanna make sure that you do is, if can you give your information, I know that's usually at the end, but I wanna start with that. Hmm. Can you give information so that they can contact your office to learn more about what you do? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can put it in the chat and, but yeah, if you, um, I'm easy to Google. If you Google my name, it's going to, I'm showing up. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> if you put UH after it, then I'm, that, that, that page will show up as well. So I, I'm real easy to find. And then, and we're, we're uh, happy to take any patients. And uh, even though I'm medical director of the Cutler Center for men, I, I still have more women than men. Women are just better at going to the doctor than, than, than men. So I, I take men and women. Somebody thought, that I stopped seeing women because um, I was a couple center for men, but that that's not true. No, great, thank you. And you guys go to, you can also visit nia.org, N-I-A-A-H.org to get more information when he talk, what Dr. Hall was talking about, as well as drgreghall.com. It'll tell you all about him. You get to read some of and listen to some of his podcasts, you know, to re-emphasize and learn more about what he said. Because I'll say before I start the conversation, I learned what multivitamin I should be taking. Um, and also for vitamin D, my wife and I always have that conversation. So again, let's go ahead and um, jump in though about the subject in hand. Again, thank you uh, for sharing that information and please share this. So ladies, men uh, of, of the kind, uh, please share this information beyond this conversation today. So let's start out with uh, translational science because that was a new concept for me. When Jalise reached out, I said, I can't ask him about that. He's the doctor. <laughs> uh, but um, again, learned a lot as I did the research. So it focuses on the scientific and operational principles underlying each step of the translation process. Understand these processes, identify effective approaches and removing barrier speeds up the adoption of best practices into community settings and helps bring more treatment to more people more quickly. One of the translational uh, science principle is a focus on unmet needs. So the question I have for you, um, Dr. Hall, is can you give us an example of a glaring unmet need that helped inspire the founding of NIA or another gap that you helped close? Yeah, and I think that probably the biggest glaring un unmet need is, is the number of the support, you, the lack of support for um, pre-black pre-med students, um, you know, trying to get into medical school. I mean, I see that I worked at Cleveland State uh, for a couple of years with a program that was helping students get in, and and it was a, it was just amazing that the guidance counselors, not just at Cleveland State, but a lot of places, would would talk students out of being pre-med. Someone would say, "I want to be a doctor," and the guidance counselor would talk disproportionately talk 
the African American pre med students out of it, or more more frequently, they would sign them up with a schedule that was not possible. You know, so you've got chemistry one on one, biology one on one, English one on one, and you know, and you know, in your first semester. And so I've had valedictorians at their high school come. And and by October, middle of October, they're not pre med, and they're on the verge of being put out of college because they're they're not they've already failed their first several tests because they weren't prepared to study for a college level exams, and they weren't prepared to to how to to push back on their their guidance counselors when they give them this crazy schedule, uh, and the things that they should all take at the same time. And so I was just like really like you know someone needs to talk to these students and tell them don't take chemistry and biology, you got to go slower, you got to be more deliberate, you need to do this. And so um, that was just, there was just no one there to help them. And, and you, 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 you assume a guidance counselor when you go to college, and I'm not just talking about Cleveland State, it's, it's true in all these colleges, uh, that they're there to help you, but they're not necessarily there to help you as much as you think, right? And that's, that's just a fact, right? And so they need mentors. And there are other, other students have their uncle's a doctor, their father's a doctor, their grandfather's a doctor. Say, no, I man, don't take, take, don't take all that medicine, you know, take this. Or like they were doing when I was in college, they would take a class at Cleveland State during the summer, organic chemistry, then go back to college and then take it again, right? So they, they already knew I'm taking organic chemistry for the first time. And these students have already, the people that get an A is, have already taken it once, right? And not for credit, and now they're taking it a second time. So these strategies, you have to tell students, you need to study before you go in. You need to be deliberate about how you go for it. So that's a really un unmet need. So a lot of a lot of people want to be doctors, but they were they were basically sabotaged, um, you know, by by the colleges themselves, by by them not giving them the the right advice, uh, you know, for that. So that that's I guess that's kind of a long winding answer, but that was a huge un unmet need there. No, um, thanks for sharing. And I want to go back and just make sure I reemphasize again, go to NIA.org um, and make sure because on there, there's listed where you have practitioners throughout the country. Now, and while we're kind of on that subject, can you speak to that certification? What does that mean to be certified uh, when I look on that website? Well, when you look on it, so what ha happens is the, the doctors need to watch continuing medical education um, courses that are online that are specific about bias, about emotional and cultural intelligence, about best practices in hypertension and cardiovascular disease, best practices in screening cancer for African-Americans. Because again, there's, there's data, just like I went over on how to best screen for colon cancer, for example. Um, you shouldn't have a sigmoidoscopy, which looks halfway. Um, African-Americans tend to have more further polyps. And so a sigmoidoscopy is a naturally accepted appropriate screen for screening colon cancer in everyone except for African-Americans. And, the, you know, National and the American Academy of Gastroenterology has said that, you know, it's inappropriate to do a sigmoidoscopy on African-Americans. But there's people who don't even know that, right? So if you don't know, you'll send someone for a sigmoidoscopy and they'll, they'll tell them it's normal. In reality, they've had the cancer disproportionately have left-sided, uh, right-sided um, colon cancers. So if you know that, then you know, okay, I can't send an African-American for a sigmoidoscopy. They need a full colonoscopy or they need whatever, you know, right? So just based on data. And so um, that makes the providers more apt to give appropriate care to the, to the patient. Wow, no, that's powerful. So as we move on um, to the next question I have for you, and I'll make sure I get some of that in the chat. Don't hesitate to drop questions you may have. Um, you have an expert, you see a trendsetter, in, in his industry um, and, and in our community. So make sure you drop some questions um, in that chat so we can get those answered. Um, so as more research focuses on including the community in this process to better address health disparities and uh, achieve equity, what are the ways that NIA will help to facilitate those relationships and potential collaborations? Well, um, I think, the, and you led right in there appropriately, the, the certification is gonna be one of those things. Um, I think knowing um, it's it's one thing to know to to know that you have biases, right? So there there I tend to group people, but whenever a, a, you know a, a physician or a provider says um, I treat everyone the same, right? That's run from that person. <laughs> run, don't walk. Run from them. 
because they treat everyone the same, then that's bad, right? Because <laughs> they're 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 not they're not they're not for you. You don't and you don't treat everyone the same, right? You use your emotional intelligence to determine whether this person's mad at you or not, whether this person's um, you know happy or not, and then you need to you need to adjust your care appropriately, right? And so it, when you when you go in with a patient, some I have, have some black patients that love doctors. They they take their medicine. They do. They're great. And I, those people get a different me than the people who hate doctors and don't want to take medicine and hate, they, they're going to get more time talking about this and, and, the, and the benefits and talking about their family history, you know? And so, um, so, so what, what that certification is doing is having them learn about themselves. What are your biases and have them learn about the patients? How do you determine what the patients, patients buy, have biases as well. And so, you know, it's just, it just opens up a lot of the provider's eyes and they have to do eight hours of that in order to become uh, certified and they get certified by the nonprofit. And then they, they can, they can say, I'm NEA certified. And we hope to have at some point where the, where the patients will say, they're going to look for a doctor that's NEA certified, that, that, that has taken this training, that's ready to provide the best care to their patients. No, I appreciate it. I'm going to jump over to the, the chat real quick, Dr. Hall. The question came in, when does the African-American Center for Health open? Will it be staffed by a majority of African-American clinicians? Well, the number answer number two is yes, it will be by staff by majority, but not exclusively African-Americans. There's just not enough specialists across that to, to do that, but it will be staffed. Uh, the majority will certainly be in that. And again, if you look at the Center for Asian-American Health across the country, the Center for Hispanic Latino Health, the majority of the providers are Hispanic, Latino, or Asian, and they have a minority of, of, of other providers in there. So we'll be consistent uh, with that. And we are hoping to uh, open with the second quarter, but the website is, is ready to go. We, we have a lot of things much further along than we have, but, uh, you know, University Hospital, they're very deliberate about things, right? <laughs> and so, but, but it does look like we're going to open it. And it's, and it's a virtual network. It's not a place. Right. And so you go online, you'll see, oh, I'm in Richmond Heights or I might be at a Hoosia and then another doctor might be, you know, someplace else. And so you want to be able to um, to go and see them where they are. It's, it's going to be a nurse. It's not going to initially be a place. Some of them will be at Otis Moss and then, um, you know, some will be in other offices. So it's not initially going to be a place. It's going to be a network of providers. No, that's good. Thank you for sharing that. Get, I have another question in the chat because I want to make sure this is your opportunity. Ask the doctor. We, we're going to change the ask the doctor segment. Um, so you have them at your fingertips today. So let's go ahead and um, go to another question in the chat. Do any of the la other large health systems in Cleveland have a focused African-American health center like the one you begun at UH? Was it difficult to get higher leadership buy-in for this at UH? Well, here's the thing, um, and um, the the it, it's a complicated. I'm not starting because it's a complicated question, right? Yes. Because we all know that Cleveland Clinic had the the minority men's health, right? And so, <clears throat> what I was trying to do was saying, when my time on the Commission for Minority Health, I had to spend time as a governor appointed. I had to spend time on Asian American health, Hispanic Latino health, African American health. Um, you know, on minority help across it. I had to spend an equal amount of time on all that. But what I was finding was African-Americans had a majority of the health problems, right? And as I showed you in my talk, African-Americans have the majority of the health problems. It's not a minority health problem. There's an African-American health problem. And so, um, you know, no one has put the name on it, right? That is always, you know, African is minority, it's urban health. It's, you know, um, people of color, health. <clears throat> so no one wants to say, no, it's black health. It's, it's African-American health, right? And so um, no one has has said it was African-American health or black health. They've always said minority health or at Cleveland Clinic. It was a, at, at Cleveland State. It was an urban health initiative, right? But they did it in order to increase the number of African-American students, right? But it was still urban health. It was, ah. Eh, so, um, so no one has put put the, put, the, put it in, in the name, and I was deliberate about my only thing was it we need to have it in the name, right? And so, and and, and you're right, um, uh, Metro Health, is where Dr. Maudlin is now, 
he went there and started a minority health initiative. And even at Cutler, we have a minority men's initiative, you know, looking at minority men. But, but you know, I, I, I like to take a focus, laser focus on the problem. And as I've showed you based on life expectancy, cancer prevention, diabetes, hypertension, the problem is an African-American problem. And so I wanted to put my efforts and energy toward that specific problem because Hispanic Latinos have problems but, and they're not the same as African-American problems. There's language barriers. There's, there's other cultural differences. Asian Americans also have problems and they're not the same. You know, they have a totally different, as I showed you with the cause of death, you have to spend more time looking at cancer screening for Asian American. If you were going to do an Asian American initiative, whereas with African American, no, you got to spend more time on blood pressure, stroke, heart failure, kidney failure. So it's a totally different set. So you can't say, make it a minority approach, and you know, and really <laughs> take a focused approach on something. You're not taking a focused approach when you take a minority approach or a poverty approach. So that Mr. Purnell and I make a little bit more money than some people, and but our risk for premature death, our risk for death from cancer, diabetes, all that is is worse than the poorest white male, the poorest Asian American male, the poorest Hispanic Latino. So, so, you know, so it's not about having insurance or, or having, a, you know, having a, a better income. It's, it's something else. And so that's, we need to spend time focusing on that. No, thank you. Um, thank you. So it, again, please drop questions in the chat, but I have a few more questions for you today, Dr. Hall, according to the association for American medical colleges, black or African American students made up 10% of total matriculants, a decrease from 10.2 in 2022 and 2023, but up from 8.4 in 2016, 2017. When we think about what NIA does for mentorship, what impact will your program have on these figures? And you kind of shared a little bit about that, but I think that's really important because beyond the work that you're doing at the Cutler Center, Again, that mentorship really speaks to, you know, succession here in our community and making sure that we're able to address these long term. So can you please give us some feedback or any future plans you may have? Yeah, you know what? Unfortunately, <clears throat> we're small and we're not going to impact those numbers much. But we have to start somewhere. Right. And and it's important for even for everyone on this on this um, Zoom meeting. Um, you know, mentorship is important. You should have mentors. I got mentors that I check in with. Right. And and I don't make any decision in a in a vacuum. No, I don't buy a house. I don't do, I don't do anything. Major decision in my life. I check with my mentors. I check with my wife too, right? But but uh, but you 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 can't make these decisions in a vacuum because you're more apt to make a mistake. And you don't want to. If it's a big decision, you it's going to be a big mistake, right? And so mentors are very important. And throughout your life throughout your life and no matter where you are, if you think you don't, if you don't have a mentor, you need one. And if you think you don't, if you think you don't need a mentor, you really, really need one, right? And so the um the 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 students don't they don't have a doctor that they can talk to. They don't have anyone they can shadow. They don't have anyone that they can bounce ideas with. They they have no one, right? Not few, no one. And so what Nia is providing for these pre-med students that know about it is the opportunity to have access to someone that says, oh man, that's a crazy idea. Don't do that. You know, you need to do this here. You need to do that. And then that's what increases their, their rate of success. There are things that we say conversationally that you can't put on a website, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, you can't, you can't put that on a website, but, but you can tell somebody, oh man, don't, don't, <clears throat> don't do that. Right. But if we, we put on the website, you know, no black students should take organic chemistry, physics, and biology in the same semester. Oh my God. They'll be, they'll be, they'll be hanging us on the in the, the town square. But you can pull someone aside, man, you better stop that. Don't, don't do that. You, you're setting yourself up for failure. And then at least they can make that decision, right? And so it's it's important that that mentorship at all ages and in all professions is is key. And no matter, and, and you you look at, you know, they were talking about, you know, Kobe Bryant, whoever you admire in basketball has mentors, right? The, the richest person has super rich people overseas somewhere that they that they admire that can tell them something, right? So if, if there was any one take-home message, it would be mentorship. No, 
totally agree. You know, I'm in an industry, Dr. Hall, where less than 1% of African Americans are CPAs. Um, so you're talking about not walk, walking into buildings and co corporations that you don't see anyone that looks like you. Mentorship changed my life and literally, you know, has positioned me, you know, in the things I get to do today. So um, the next question I'll talk um, is, you know, you have a lot, you've done a lot of great things. And truly, when I spent the time Googling you, I was really impressed mm -hmm. uh, with the work that not just lifestyle, what you do personally, but what you've done, you know, professionally and, and for our community. So what exciting things on top of everything you've already accomplished, what, what things do you have to look for? Are you looking forward to this year for Nia or just professionally to help continue to do the work that you're doing? Well, I'm 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 excited about a whole lot of things. I am really excited about the Center for African American Health at UH and getting that going. I, I think that's going to be a, we're going to be a national model, and and I th I'm really excited about that. I'm excited that that people are doing things as they mentioned in the chat. You know, Metro is doing great things with the Minority Health Men's Fair, uh, Minority Health Fair, and they're addressing not just minority men but actually minorities in general. And so I, I I you know I applaud that. There's a lot there's a lot going on with that. And and that's a good thing. And so I'm excited to be a part of that. Um, the book that you mentioned um, has been approved for a second edition. So I'm excited about trying to write, figure out when the time to 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 work on a second edition and make it better. You know, uh, um, and so I feel like it's like a second edition is like a two term president. You know, it's like, OK, I'm it was really our, I, you know, I, that's how I see it. Right. That's right. That's so right. Um, so it's I'm really excited about um, about working on that. And seeing how we can uh, what we can do with that, and then with Nia, you know, we're we we got a um, a grant from the Cleveland Foundation, which we're very very appreciative to, and we're reaching out to other organizations across the country um, with opportunity to really help. And so I think that uh, you know that's going to be exciting as well. Oh no, good! Congratulations on all that. Um, you know, kind of, and, and I'm going to go back and ask a question that um, because I see it in the chat, people want to you know get more involved. And they're very happy that you drill down in the data. Um, and so if a researcher wanted to collaborate with Nia, what would um, some of the research question priorities, who should someone contact to express interest in working with your organization? Well, you can you, if you go to the website, you can you can contact there's a contact page. Um, uh, Stacy Easterling is the executive director. And so if you do an uh, email, I think it's Stacy at, at Nia.com. Org um, and, and it's she's a, a e y s s t a c e y at n i a h dot org, um, or you can certainly email me at any of my emails and, and I I can forward it and we'll look at it. I think you know we we are really trying to um, um, partner. We we got a grant uh, from the uh, National Institute of Health for EDCs uh, related to um, endocrine disrupting chemicals and how they are impacting African American women. And so um, we had a whole campaign related to that, and we're actually in the running for for the second phase of that of that of that grant. And so we're excited to be able to to really partner anything that's specifically aimed toward African Americans. Again, we and so we our focus is clear: it's not minority, it's not poverty, it's not you know, inner city, it's not urban, it's African American. So no matter what your socioeconomic status and self-reported African Americans, right? And so it's African committee Caribbeans, first generation. Whatever, whatever there is, that's what, what our focus is. And so, if if your research is is focusing on that population, we're certainly open to um, to talk to you about that. No, I, I definitely I, I appreciate it. And again, go visit that website because there's so much great information there for you. Um, so I want to ask, can we act, ask about Nia? You kind of answered it, um, but when you look back at your career to date. What are you most proud of? Again, you've accomplished so many great things to this point. What are you most proud of? Well, I, you know, I think I'm I'm most proud of the fact that I'm still learning, right? I um that I'm still growing, I'm still learning, I'm still becoming a better doctor. Um, you know, I'm a better doctor this year than I was last year, and and, and the year before, and um I'm and I'm I still love seeing patients, and I love learning from my patients, and I think I've I like, I'm, I'm proud, you know, there's people that just get stuck, you know, and they get bitter, <laughs> you know, and they get tired and, um, and I'm not stuck bitter or tired, you know, I'm, I'm excited about, you know, making a difference 
And, you know, and I think that's just a, it's just a blessing. I mean, it's a blessing that I feel that way. You know what I'm saying? It's a blessing that I can get up and I go to work and I'm excited about seeing the patients. And I'm also excited about talking to people here and across the country about African-American health and kind of changing. I'm excited about being able to improve life expectancy. As I get older, hell, I want the life expectancy to go up for African-American men. I, I, it, that, I'm in the single digits. If I go by the data, I've only got single, I got less than 10 years left. And so I got to bring that number up. Uh, and I, I, and re, you know, I've got reasons to want to do that, right? So self-serving right. reasons to want to do that. Uh, and 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 have have my kids and their friends and the rest of my family have a better life. We, you know, as African Americans, we have to deal with so much death. My mother died at 52 of leukemia. You know, uh, my father died at 79, and and I see people my age who have parents. Where I'm like, wow, 62, and you your parents are alive. My parents haven't been alive in years, right? So all that death. There are people. My kids don't have grandparents. You know, I mean, they're in their 20s. There's a ton of white people, Asian Americans, they've got parents and grandparents well into their lives. And that's a lot of mentorship, you know, just family mentorship that we miss out on. We miss out on. And you travel down 105 I, um, from St. Clair to um, Superior and beyond on a Saturday is cars everywhere. And they're all at funerals, Right because we're dying prematurely because of these health issues. And so we've got to stop, you know, and that's just a loss. You know, it's, this, it's just a loss that we can't recoup on. Uh, and, and so we've got, as, as much as we can make try to make a difference to prevent all this loss, I think that's that's what's important. Yeah, no, that's good. And it's, it, you brought up, it's so funny, you brought up St. Clair to say Superior. Hmm. My wife grew up on Hamden and Pierpoint and she lost both of her parents before she was the age of 30 years old. Mm. Um, and when you think about my children, they have one grandmother and that's my mother, but no other grandparents. So again, you know, it just speaks to your work and the importance of it. Um, now we have people, now this question is more to, you know, just giving advice. If you have someone that's an aspiring uh, physician scientist and is interested in starting a nonprofit, but I also want you to speak to just everybody in general who's on here just really to emphasize. So this is kind of a loaded question because we've talked about Nia. We've talked about, of course, we, if I ask you your biggest need, we're always going to say you can make a donation. We need more funding to do the work, but what are some other things that you say would be at the, the, maybe the top two things to continue to do, help you do the work that you're doing? So if you answer all those for me, I appreciate it. Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, as far as Nia, if you know someone that wants to be pre-med, you know, either in high school or, or, or college or something, you know, we'd like to get them as early as possible so that we can kind of get them on the right on the right path. And so people, a lot of people don't know about it because we don't have the money to advertise as much. And so if you just know someone who wants to be a doctor or if you know a doctor that that would be willing to be a mentor, um, we, we're, we're still enrolling them and, the, and we pay them. We pay the doctors for their time. And many times, um, you know, they ask black professionals to volunteer to do this and volunteer. We're always we're always asked to volunteer. Uh, and so it, that's, it, you know, but our time is valuable, right? And so it's important to, to pay people. So our mentors are paid uh, for, for the time they spend mentoring because it's valuable, right? It, it, it is really is valuable. And so um, if you know some uh, Black doctor that needs to be, that wants to be a mentor, please refer them. And if you know a pre-med student, please refer them because the more people that know about us, the better, the better we are. And, and we've talked to organizations that have said they would fund us if we were bigger. You know, some of the national pharmaceutical things that we've applied for, they say, well, you're just not quite big enough. So uh, just increasing awareness would be great. Um, and then aside from that, um, in terms of um, who we would we would partner with, we're, we're happy to, to partner with anyone if anyone wants to volunteer with us. And it's a nonprofit. So if it, whatever you give is, you know, tax deductible and and whatever connections you might have, if you know some foundation that that's looking to support that. Because with, you know, affirmative action, that was huge. I mean, you think Roe versus Wade was huge, which it was huge. The firm of action was huge. And it's going to be very detrimental to having Black people get into medical school um, and, and getting and, and, and beyond. And we're going to see that ripple as, as we get older. We're going to be the people that are going to be suffering because of that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we're going to wrap up with one last question out of the chat. Um, and the question is, I see that research is one of the pillars 
uh, for the Center for African American Health at UH. Um, Dr. Hall, can you share your vision um, in the role of research aimed toward supporting and including African Americans, specifically in Cleveland and within the Center for African American Health? Yeah, well, the research, you know, I'm all research based, right? Everything in my book is all based on research. And so it was most of it is research that was incidentally identified issues in the African American community. It wasn't something that was done on an African American population. It was done on a broad population. And within that was a subpopulation of African Americans that we've, and we learned some stuff from that subpopulation within the bigger study. So it would be nice to be able to have studies that that from the from the from the beginning is saying how are we going to improve African American health outcomes in blood pressure control or how are we going to improve decrease the amounts of stroke or decrease the amount of of accidental drug overdoses or you know things of that nature and so and say that that targeting the African American population in a good way you know I'm mean, saying this is how we can help the African American versus incidental you know, normally a lot of the information we found out was incidentally determined when they were doing a study, doing something else. And so this way we can be more proactive, we can be more directed. And then that's when we find out our best information and, and that it's reliable, really. That's good. Last question, and it's the personal. I'm going to take, Jalise, don't kick me off and shut my, my Zoom off, but I'm going to take personal privilege to ask, because this is a common question I get, Dr. Hall, is if you could give three of the top things people should look for when they're choosing a doctor um, at this age, what would those be? Well, I, I think you should not settle. Um, um, you you want to you wanna look look at a doctor that 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 you feel like you would connect with. So it's, it's important to read a bio and see what's important to them. You know what I mean? And I think it's it's important. People, most of my patients, black patients that get me, they Google black doctor because they're looking for a black doctor. So uh, African Americans tend to look for a black doctor because they think that they can connect with them. I do, you know, I, I have a lot of black men. They're looking for a black male doctor, right? And so um, that's one of the first things they look for. And because we've shown that, you know, through through from infant mortality through geriatrics, it's just a fact. Right, that, and it's not controversial. It's, I just, I'm sorry to give. It's just a fact. Black people do better when they have black doctors. Right, there are exceptions. Right, so don't don't put me out. <laughs> right, or at least there are exceptions. There are people that black people that love their Asian Indian doctor, that love their white doctor, and and they do great with them. Right, but across the population, black people do better when they have a black doctor. Black babies do better when their mothers are with a black obstetrician. That's just a fact, right? So why that is, maybe it's because we connect better. Maybe it's cultural differences. Who knows? Maybe if we can educate providers, they'll, they'll do better. So I think that's the one thing. You have, you have to have access to them. And I think now that we have um, 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 Epic, you know, there's, there's a whole new level of access. I've got probably 20 questions for people who want to be put on Ozempic and they, they want, they, you know, that my liver test is slightly off. What do you think? You know, but, but, you know, that I got to answer them. I have to answer those questions. So if you can't, you know, connect with your doctor and get answers, then I'm doing it. So shoot, they should be able to do it too. Right. And so um, you need to be able to have easy access uh, to them. And, um, and, you know, and I think, but you should also, you know, cut him a break, right? Um, you know, I had a guy ask me uh, like 10 different questions on his labs and, it, you know, his cholesterol level. And it, what about my PSA? Is it normal? Are you sure it's not too high? And it's all this stuff is normal, but he smoked. I said, so, you know, you we spent 20 minutes talking about a whole bunch of nothing when <laughs> your problem is you're still smoking. So we're going to talk about that now, right? Because that's the problem in the room is not, the fact that you're one of your liver function tests is two points away from normal or you know, abnormal, right? It's the fact that you are smoking, right? And so you have to be able to say, you know, you take the responsibility for, you know, for, for your health and, and say, you know, it's not just I'm going to, the doctor needs to tell me and I'm going to then leave and decide whether I'm going to take the medicine or not. No, you have a responsibility as part of that relationship to, to, to kind of be an engaged uh, patient. No, thank you. And as you all can see, this is why Dr. Hall is one of our Black history makers. And we just want to thank you for just giving us so much great, you know, data and just sharing all this great information that will continue to help 
you know, move our health in the right direction. So thank you for all your work. And I'll pass it back over to Jalise. And thank you, um, CTSC, for having me on this call as well. Thank you so much, Larice. Uh, appreciative of all that you do. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Kudos, kudos, kudos. We are, uh, so you have some number one fans over here and we appreciate Nia for sponsoring our Black Maternal Health Equity Summit on Sunday, April 14th from noon to four at Cleveland State University. The registration uh, link is in the chat. You can learn more. We would love to see you there. So who's next? We have Dana Langford, co-founder of Village of Healing. That'll be next Wednesday, February 21st from noon to one on Zoom. We hope you'll join us. What can you do today? You can schedule a research equity, accessibility, diversity, and inclusion consultation with our team at spark.case.edu. And that is free. You can sign up to attend future programming and join our listserv and review CTSC DEIA resources. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Have a great afternoon and congratulations again, Dr. Hall. Thank you.